Thank you. I uh, generally talk about uh, social movements uh, when I speak um, about globalization. Mike's picking me up, right? You can hear me in the back. Okay, thank you. Um, I understand that yesterday there was some talk about my relationship to Emmanuel Wallerstein, and indeed, uh, if there had been time, I would have spoken again about uh, the altogether misnamed or Eurocentrically named social movements um, uh, and how they actually do relate to globalizing globalization. But I've chosen um, to speak about my other area of activism, the area that uh, you mentioned, the um, uh, children's education, because I think it's very important to look at that when we talk about uh, globalization and its future. My specific title comes from uh, my intervention at the International Women's University after Saskia Sassen's talk. Uh, Professor Sassen and I are very good friends and our friendship rests on our difference. She's also one of our foremost thinkers of globalization. In the spirit then of friendly critique, I repeat my discomfort with her presentation on that occasion as I understood it and recall why it led to an exhortation to globalize globalization. Because I felt Sassen in her current incarnation keeps her eye on metropolitan countries looking only at central banking systems, urban complexes, and or telecommunication when she looks at the rest of the world, and because she believes that the role of the state is definitively over, she said that underclass migrant women are empowered through citizenship practices even when they are undocumented because meeting with migrant women from other countries during her day in London or Frankfurt, she goes beyond a merely national consciousness. Although Sassen felt that this was thickening globalization discourse, she cautioned us again and again that such empowerment was not for the individual but was systemic. I did not think this could be seen as women's empowerment in globalization. It was this that made me say that we had to globalize our view of globalization and engage with women's counter-globalizing struggles in the periphery and continue the struggle for civil rights rather than simply speak of empowerment without documentation of immigrant women in the metropolitan state whose repressive role is not over merely because the state can be bypassed as an inconvenience sometimes in globalization. For similar reasons of conviction and omission, Sassen felt that there was a new Global Women's Fellowship. Some of us have attempted to situate, heterogenize, and criticize this self-styled international civil society component of the global feminist dominant in much of our published work and our on the, on, on the ground work. Indeed, there is a good deal of careful criticism of this group among many Marxist feminists embracing a range from Jean Franco to Farida Akhtar. To attend to this is also to take a globalized view of globalization. Sassen often suggests that because of the growing role of human rights interventions, there is now a new legal subject. This is where a cultural critique, in order to globalize itself, must learn to learn from below. This is too complex an argument to summarize. I have been able to present an anecdotal version in the Fukuoka Women's Center in Japan, a version that I have repeated in California and Germany. I will try to tighten this argument because I'm completely against the specious presentation of cultural human rights. I will try to tighten the argument for an amnesty lecture in February. Today, I want to share with you how to access the above rather than the below as it trains the triumphant dispenser of human rights globally. It leads to a simple question. If child laborers are bad, why are child investors good? What's the difference between child consumers and child investors? I published an account of the misunderstanding of the child labor situation in Bangladesh in my last book. That account was not really about child labor, but about making human rights a trade-related investment issue, about the easy goodwill of boycott politics, about the lazy cruelty of moral imperialism, about doing deals with local entrepreneurs, 
themselves bound by their own greed and the greed of global trade, resulting in no labor laws. It was about finding in this a justification for a permanent involvement in a country's affairs through foreign aid. There, I discussed the use of racism to divide international labor by way of a gender studies meeting at Columbia, where an explanation of this interested use of child labor as a way of blocking export from developing countries was summarily dismissed in an absurd cultural relativist way by a US nationalist domestic welfare sociologist female colleague as if child labor was just a part of Bangladeshi culture and we should not interfere. I commented there that the righteous anger of the Child Labor Deterrent Act of 1993 or the benevolence of a long distance benefactor loses all plausibility when confronted with the actual indifference and deception that follow the dismissal of these children. These are not unusual intuitions. Yusuf Butros Ghali, the Egyptian trade minister, asked at the end of the Seattle debacle, I quote, why, all of a sudden, when third world labor has proved to be competitive, do industrial countries, through a little gap in the gap, do industrial countries start feeling concerned about our workers? I asked the same question in my book, quoting the Harkin Bill, the Child Labor Act. I quote the bill, adult workers in the United States and other developed countries should not have their jobs imperiled by imports produced by child labor in developing countries, end of quote. My own direct involvement for the last decade has been with the nature, quality, effectiveness, and relevance of the teaching in ground level schools. I can say with conviction that those questions cannot be raised in the hapless situation that follows the so-called restoration of the sanctity of childhood at the direct foreign investment garment factories. Therefore, I asked this question in my book. Capitalism is better than bond slavery, but is exploitation the only way out? I open today's remarks at that point. For, in spite of various kinds of moves on both sides, the situation in broad strokes has not changed in Bangladesh, and I would only repeat myself with sensationalist detail in a 30-minute talk. The idea of childhood as a time of innocence and protection from both the knowledge and cares of the world is a red herring in the debate over child labor. The dreary story of children's education, at best little short of useless but still withheld, goes on as usual. The education supposedly offered to the children, which is withheld, is useless because it cannot fit the national system of education. But the national systems of education are themselves defunct upon the South Asian subcontinent when it comes to the education of the very poor, especially the rural poor. I'm not dismissing Indian education. I'm a product of the University of Calcutta. I'm talking about the scandal of the absolute divide when it comes, in fact, when you fall below the middle class into the urban working class, the urban proletarian, uh, proletariat, the rural uh, poor. The prevailing system of education is to memorize answers to antiquated questions relating to set books, the occasional human interest story of villagers establishing their own schools or NGOs joining a UN drive for schools must first be evaluated against this grid if indeed it penetrates to the bottom layers of diversified subaltern life, which it doesn't. There is something like an opening into women's history even here. The sharp young girl wading up through the muddy, sluggish currents of gendered rural politics can aim for the reserved seats on the various organs of state government, generally to become pawns in the hands of veteran mainstream players. When they enter UN statistics as women entering politics, the Declaration of Mexico, 1975, the entry is meaningless. Therefore, the real infrastructural change for us as educators is to ponder how the details of the philosophy of education at that level can be improved and just pondering will improve nothing. We know that such a huge difference between the primary education of the rich and the poor is not unknown even in New York City, where I live for the moment. And although in the general culture, the liberation of the girl child has abundantly produced a backlash of concern for the boy child, it would be appropriate to discuss 
how, in the effort to practice the internalization of democratic reflexes in the very young, one must also fight to establish gender justice in the follow-up. In the interest of time, I will leave such considerations for the discussion session and simply distinguish my position from the popular panaceas offered in the area of children's education without specific reference to sexual difference so that I can get on to my questions. If child laborers are bad, why are child investors good? What's the difference between child consumers and child investors? The panaceas offered in the area of children's education are generally confined to celebrating the building of school buildings and the placing of teacher bodies in them. The actual quality and methodology of the education offered on that level is not and cannot be discussed because the benefactors are, for various kinds of reason, unable or uninterested to evaluate them or in evaluating them. This panacea can include an entire spectrum from immigrants sending money to found schools in the country of origin to, and I quote, private sector venture philanthropy, venture philanthropy, that's a step beyond corporate philanthropy, you understand? Private sector venture philanthropy, building classrooms in Ethiopia and backing the Ethiopian adoption project, which places Ethiopian orphans with foreign parents, end of quote. Corporate philanthropy, development sustaining cost efficiency, Impatient human rights intervention have no time to respect local responsibility-based systems that have been allowed to stagnate and cannot fulfill the imaginative capacity that we are gifted with. I'm not against sending money to build school buildings, but the teaching of very young children whose cultural base has been neglected for centuries can even be harmed by the presence of nothing but money, buildings, and bodies. In India, for example, the net cast by the UNDP, which since 1989, of course, has completely gone over into becoming a tool of the uh, transnational agencies, cast by the United Nations Development Program, penetrates the SCST, or the Scheduled Caste, Scheduled Tribe level, the, the bottom, uh, including also the uh, so-called other backward castes, penetrates the, uh, the SCST level and is helped along by women in the capital city in the name of establishing non-formal elementary schools. Its data collection is, as it were, subcontracted to the custodian of the subaltern. Now, this is going to sound a little, uh, a little uh, opaque here because I can't actually tell you in detail, I can't explain what th actually happens there because this is not very well known. But I'll be very happy in discussion to, t uh, to, uh, to flesh out this story and tell you why this becomes an instrument of data collection. Its data collection is, as it were, subcontracted to the custodian of the subaltern. I have copies of those readably innocent survey forms devised by these ground-level activists of the subaltern. I would be happy to expand on this. The DFID, the British Department of Foreign Investment and Development, flings its net wide, but does not always penetrate quite so far down, perhaps because it is tied to a nation state. Even efforts based in the particular southern country and run by activists don't necessarily lead to the kind of mind-changing which patiently learns from disenfranchised children how to teach them to draw on their cultural resources to connect to the habits of democratic citizenship. For this effort, which I sometimes compare to invisible mending, unrelated to resistant nationalist content like know your rights, uh, love your country, etc., or indoctrination into this kind of stuff is not popular when one is desperately and necessarily interested, as are the activists, in quick solutions to immediate oppression. On the other hand, if this is understood as ground level education, one can in fact reduce fascists, pledging allegiance. We can assume that the quick fix of something called education for the children of the very poor, even if that promise were kept, would not constitute freedom from poverty and domination, and certainly not the reflexes and habits of the practice of freedom. It is this practice of freedom that I have called reflexes of democratic culture. I must now confess that it is these reflexes that can, in my mind, turn capital around again and again to the preservation of a socialist state anchored in a responsibility-based ethical calling. A more politico-philosophical discussion of this conviction about a democracy always in the mode of to come 
would be required in any extended discussion of children's education. Time now to go back to the questions again. If child laborers are bad, why are child investors good? What's the difference between child consumers and child investors? I hope you now see my drift. For interpretable reasons, we want to argue that it is not a good idea for their children to be paid to work. And the education that we offer as a substitute is an empty promise. On the other hand, we feel it is completely appropriate to train our children to make money without themselves working, but making others work by remote control. There is concerted primary training in exploitation. Companies are even reaching out to preschoolers, gushes CBS Market Watch, 26th August 2000, and then Morgan Stanley, Dean Witter, they actually appeared on the program talking about how they were reaching out to preschoolers. The hottest new demographic in town, I quote, is the eight to 10 year olds, 10% 10 of whom own bonds, August 20, 2000. A book published in August called Wow the Dow engages toddlers in investment through play. A book that engagingly asks why teach financial literacy is entitled Poor Dad. I hasten to add here that I have as little against investing as I have against sending money to poor countries. No socialist could be against investing as such. My point is training rich and poor children into specific and different confrontational mindsets. It is interesting that the television reporter had no understanding that in finance capital, money does not, in fact, beget money. That because competitive markets and negotiable instruments do not touch base with the production of tangible commodities constantly and directly, only means that their volume of circulation can be exponentially larger. I'm no economist, but simply keeping abreast of advanced textbooks, I know that, and I quote, with the development of modern finance, new models are developed to deal with problems of asymmetric information and information processing, institutions like banks and contracts like loans that are observed in all developed economies emerge as rational responses to a world where information is asymmetrically distributed, end of quote. Saving children from simple greed by giving to them not products but education in interaction between borrowing and lending and claiming for productive rather than individual consumption is no particular moral safeguard because there's a lot of extremely bogus moral moralizing on these uh, programs saying at least they're giving education and not just making them into consumers. The difference between the two is like the visible violence of a knife cut which makes, it, makes you bleed and radiation passing through which you cannot see. Thus, we are preparing our children to be agents of exploitation in a financialization of the globe, and it doesn't matter what color it is, it's Anglo or Anglo clone. Thus, we are preparing our children to be agents of exploitation in a financialization of the globe, directly or indirectly, while we stop their children from being agents of production, Marx's upbeat word for the working class. I don't think what is being done to our children is particularly nurturing either. If there, in the pre-subsistence arena, real education is unavailable to children, here, upon post-affluent terrain, the substantive quality of education is allowed to shrivel. Paul, and by that, I really mean a trivialization of the humanities. At the end of the day, I, am, uh, I wouldn't remain a teacher in the humanities if I believed that the imagination, the privatizing of the imagination, if I did not believe, that the privatization of the imagination is a great cultural loss. I said a minute ago that in order for a socialist globe now to be envisioned, one needs to pay some sort of attention to responsibility-based ethics. Freedom from is all fine, but it is in the freedom to that we, in fact, have no training at all in the practice of freedom. Paul M. Romer, the apostle of new growth theory, suggests, I quote, at the undergraduate level, schools be paid a bounty for increasing the number of graduates who receive science or engineering degrees, $10,000 a head. This would reward liberal arts schools whose student populations tend to run heavy with English, history, and social science majors. Does this actually support our um, workplace experience? whose student populations tend to run heavy with English history and social science majors with an incentive to expand science and engineering programs. Just as the innocence of childhood is a red herring when it comes to the criticism of child labor, 
the preponderance of the humanities is disingenuous when Mr. Romer's real point is a strike against immigration, and I quote, organized labor complains, but it will be to little effect. The industry will typically prevail reasonably because the problem is a real one, and the visa quotas for skilled immigrants are raised once more, end of quote. And this is when, where I want the um, transparency for a minute, just one. I cannot here resist the temptation to show a recent cover of the influential German newsweekly Der Stern. Now, the, why are Germans too dumb uh, for the computer? And then the picture, we don't really think this is an Indian face. I, we think this is a, a white model who's kind of dressed up with the uh, dot which signifies India. But the, I can't really discuss this now because obviously uh, it's 30 minutes. But I'd be extremely happy if anybody were at all interested as to why this picture of tradition, sari and dot, has appeared with hard hat contractors on the cover of Forbes magazine, why in fact all over the place you see this particular gendered icon as the threat to uh, threat represented by the, uh, by the um, influx of skilled immigrants in the software industry because as the, I, to quote the ILO, Euro US is a geriatric ward, not my, war, not, not my words. Children indoctrinated into e-commerce, growing into adolescents choosing majors through fast web, are being jostled out of software jobs by the very forces of globalization they help to foster. I have not the expertise and we have not the time to discuss this in detail. In the final movement of my remarks, I will focus on the corollary of my argument so far, electronic education. We have argued that among the poorest sector of the electorate in the poorest countries, also the largest sector of the electorate, the best intentioned do not concentrate on the techniques of learning. We have also argued that among the richest sector of the electorate in the richest countries, the best intentioned concentrate on the techniques of financialization. It is also a fact that the former are promised and the latter possess the resources of electronic learning. I would like to digress here for a moment to point, in terms of Marxist theory, at the speciousness of the promise of unmediated cyber literacy in the developing world. The, this actually also needs a longer arguing out. There is, in my uh, lead article in Judith Butler's recent collection, What's Left of Theory, I actually discuss, because it, it's somewhat counterintuitive reading of Marx in English, I discuss why I say the things that I'm just going to say now. It was by contemplating the made object of use, indeed Marx says that for most people, in fact, if you're just looking at, at the intuitive scene, value seems to emerge in exchange. But, uh, if you, uh, but he's trying to train his implied reader, the agent of production, the working class, that in fact, if you contemplate use value, you will see value. It was by contemplating the made object of use, notes, as use value, Gebrauchswert, and of course in the English that distinction can't be made, and by abstracting from it that Marx deduced its irreducible value constituent, abstract labor power. If the worker managed this abstraction well, then we would have a society that was at once a community and socialist, gemeinschaftlich, gesellschaftlich. This formulation is hopelessly utopian, without an understanding of responsibility. But at least Marx thought this. I should mention here that this attempt by Marx to deconstruct the binary opposition between Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, found in the anthropology of his time, in his vision of socialism, has been obliterated in translation. It is invariably translated common to all societies. In such a society, people will of course use objects of use or notes. It is just that considerations of that human activity is irrelevant for learning the way to socialism. But if a Gesellschaft is to be also a Gemeinschaft, it must continue to learn the last bit, I'm arguing, from below, undo the forgotten origin Hegelian story into the mode of a necessarily impossible to come. Let us now reproduce Marx's lesson in the field of telecommunication, computer telephony, and the circuits of electronic capitalism. Marx contemplated, you see, you, you know, because over and over again you hear, we need a completely different kind of theory now to understand the dot-com world and so on and so forth. I think one has to go a little uh, ways beyond Capital One in order to see 
that without being a Marxist fundamentalist, which I certainly am not, it is, it is still possible to understand what's going on rather better than simply declare a rupture. Um, let us now reproduce Marx's lesson in the field of telecommunication, computer telephony, and the circuits of electronic capitalism. Marx contemplated the made use object as use value. We must contemplate the produced knowledge object as knowledge value, machinal epistemology, human or otherwise. This is not a Luddite position. One must be able to understand that so-called natural intelligence is a machine. Machinal epistemology, human or otherwise, as data. If we abstract from knowledge as from use, we will finally arrive at the irreducible value constituent, data, abstract intellectual labor power produced as or by artificial intelligence. It is, of course, in its exchange that value as finance capital appears. It is because we have ignored Marx's insistence on the difference between use and use value that we have no protection against the constant sale of telecommunication and high tech as knowledge. If in contemporary philosophical theoretical accounts of globalization, the line from Lenin pointing at the importance of the international network of imperialist central banking systems is all but forgotten, in the deconstructive thinking of ethics, the invariable invocation of teletechnology cannot see its indistinguishability from, or rather its continuity with, finance capital in the value form. Here I'll emphasize that even at its best, the substitution of internet access for developing learning in children is a misunderstanding which has something like a relationship with the equation of buildings and bodies with education. That would only be feasible if the so-called natural intelligence machine were compatible with the electronic program, and if the electronic program could be uploaded into the child's brain. There are projects and promises afoot in this area which emerges in sort of sensationalist popular literature. I, do, I mean, about this kind of uh, project, not uh, literature in the sense of fiction. There, there are projects and promises afoot in that area, of course, but they're very far from anything like complex realization. I'm not a technophobe. And indeed, in the biomedical area, the business-to-business -business communication area, in the area of digital art, upon the terrain of research access where the investigator is working with already developed research skills, and for the development of databases, high tech opens vistas. In each of these areas, philosophical and political considerations continue to be undertaken by many serious thinkers and activists from many perspectives. Arching over all is the thin line between the movement of data and the operation of finance capital. The, um, in, a, in a piece that uh, is just about to come out called Mega City in a new architecture journal called Grey Room, I've tried to relate this to Marx's discussion of the transportation industry in Capital Volume 2, and it's incredibly in, um, exciting to see how prescient in many ways uh, Marx is about this situation. Of course, you can't uh, make it travel without actually reading it, but uh, there it is. Arching over all is the thin line between the movement of data and the operation of finance capital. As our children are being educated in the manipulation of electronic data access and investment, including, of course, e-commerce, they become, as a generation, the agents of exploitation, congratulating themselves on corporate philanthropy, while we forbid children in the southern sector to become responsible agents of production. Because my contacts are in Bangladesh, and my mother tongue is Bengali, I can produce a bit of handwritten Bengali here, actual accounts of this kind of, because it is not just, I learn from there rather than impose this thinking upon them. Because my contacts are in Bangladesh and my mother tongue in Bengali, I can produce uh, bits of handwritten Bengali here, detailing the devastation of local industry in the name of protecting children from organized labor. But this sort of testimony is available to anyone who cares to cross the academic research, international civil society, indigenous activist leadership barrier into hands-on contact with the ground level field worker. It would be interesting to show how even this is not the subaltern speaking, but we must get back to the question of electronic education. I have given you a list of areas where high tech is a brilliant aid, irrespective of an ethico-political position on these activities. In the area of children's education, if we understand education to be a non-coercive rearrangement of desires, 
and a cultivation of imaginative reflexes, as well as skills with content, high tech is not an unquestioned good. Telecommunication as unmediated access to learning does not work with very young children because it can make them enjoy the thing. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something that's going to, going to last. Because the simplest human activities take an enormous amount of calculation to be technically replicated, the reproduction of simple brain functions are dazzling in their mathematics. What we as educators have to remember is that however impressive and incomprehensible the calculus may be, as today's children of the world are growing up, those functions can be realized infinitely better in the natural intelligence classroom, where the teacher's internal computer and the students can be made compatible with effort. Another name for this is good teaching. Unassisted distance learning is not an option for the very young. In the case of the so-called LDCs, or least developed countries, odious social Darwinist term, where the problem of child labor isolated from infrastructure is projected as most acute, good teaching involves learning to learn the secret of that compatibility from below, for which corporate or venture philanthropy has no space, and the from above do-gooding of most activism has no time or skill. And the point I continue to repeat is that even in the best schools in God's own country, access to the internet cannot take the place of the education of a child especially when the child is slated to be indoctrinated in the arcane mysteries of managing a portfolio as a preschooler. Serious work in neural networking in the areas of cognitive science or behavioral psychology accesses children's language acquisition descriptively and promises no quick fixes. And sensationalist talk on uploading, as I mentioned, is simply that, sensationalist. I can look forward to a remote time when this becomes possible. I fear that that crisis will also be managed, as all so-called progress is. Some years ago, the feminist writer Luanne Walter tied down the invention of the child to Victorian England and Philippe Ariès to the European 18th century. The US today is breeding a monster by grafting that simpering enlightenment idea upon the axiomatics of globalizing triumphalism. Critique of child labor, celebration of child investor, bad faith about child consumer make up the current scene. Melanie Klein had written in a more innocent world, and I quote, the repeated attempts that have been made to improve humanity, in particular to make it more peaceable, have failed because nobody has understood the full depth and vigor of the instincts of aggression innate in each individual. Such efforts do not seek to do more than encourage the positive, well-wishing impulses of the person while denying or suppressing his or her aggressive ones. And so, they have been doomed to failure from the beginning." End of quote. I have tried to suggest the extent to which the positive, well-wishing impulses are themselves foolish or knavish in the US today. And I have tried to speak of the nature of an effort to harness the aggressive intelligence of the child into the reflexes of reparation. Thank you.